Before the use of the vaccine, the term poliomyelitis described the variety of clinical pathological entities, which could all look the same. This was problem, a problematic issue, and it was only addressed from 1955 afterwards, after the vaccine was deployed. There was a very successful public health campaign that was initiated by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his law partner, Basil O'Connor. At some point, the Rockefeller Institute became involved with the new organization called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. That later gave birth to the March of Dimes, which we're all familiar with because they're still collecting money today to vaccinate pregnant women and infants all over the world. Well, Dr. John Pohl was one of the enlightened doctors at the time, and he was head of a polio treatment center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he reflected upon polio epidemic days in an interview with Victor Cohn in 1975. And he said that many doctors in the 1940s were aware that the pitch men of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis and March of Dimes were responsible for the expanded terror that swept the nation. There were, there were doctors that were aware of the hoax that was going on back then. And there were doctors that were writing about it. And there were doctors that were writing about what they thought polio was, but they were categorically ignored. They were thought to be quacks. Well, because the assumption was that only polio virus could cause polio, the public believed that these pictures represented one virus only, and that a vaccine was the viable solution. The publication of these pictures was designed to make people feel what it would, like to be, what it would feel like to be like that, so that they financially supported the research and emotionally owned the resultant vaccine. This was the most dreaded complication of polio, is that you could end up on an iron lung. An iron lung was used to support respiration when the brain stem was affected or when respiratory muscles were paralyzed. This was every parent's most feared nightmare. Most people today will justify the polio vaccine with the statement, well, there are no more iron lungs today. And they're right, there are no more iron lungs today. But I'll address why there aren't any more iron lungs later. This is a graph from our book. And we have 50 color graphs that are just like this, where we gather data from all over the world, from uh, statistical data, um, from as far back as records were being kept on, these, on the um, vaccine-targeted diseases. And this graph depicts disease incidents between 1912 and 1969 in the USA. Here we see polio at the bottom. Whoops. Uh, you can barely see it, because it was a very low incidence disease, actually. But this maroon line at the bottom, we're going to look at this more closely in a minute, goes along here. And then you see in the 1950s, 1952, we have a peak. Well, polio outbreaks were first reported in the United States in 1843, but they are very small outbreaks. Right around the time that they started reporting outbreaks, there were several alterations in infant care and agriculture. In 1952, polio reached a peak in the United States with more than 21,000 cases of paralytic polio. But as we'll get into, the trick is how paralytic polio was defined. As a medical student and doctor, I never had an appreciation of the polio history between 1843 and the 1950s, until I was prompted to really look into it. After today's practice of vaccination was justified to me by referring to how polio was gone. Well, this is the maroon line extrapolated out from that previous graph and drawn out so we can see what was really going on there and track the dynamics. That 1916 spike right over here, uh, gotta get the buttons right here. Look at that, 1916. That 1916 spike represents the largest and most devastating polio epidemic in US history. This set the blueprint for things to come. There were 23,000 cases and 5,000 deaths. That's an enormous amount of deaths. Remember, deaths are only supposed to be five to 10% of 1%. So what was going on here, the 25% of people in that were afflicted with the disease died. Well, at the time, the epidemic was attributed to an Italian immigrant, to Italian immigrant children who had recently arrived in New York City. Even today, celebrity vaccine enthusiasts will inaccurately refer to the epidemic as caused by immigrants. I say inaccurately because a careful review of the immigration books revealed that this epidemic could not have been caused by those immigrants because they actually arrived after the outbreak began. Strangely, those early cases in May in Brooklyn weren't reported at the time but they were later found at a later date by a U.S. Public Health Service researcher after the fact. Well, there's another explanation for this epidemic, and that comes from Dr. H.V. Wyatt, and he published in, a, in the Open Vaccine Journal in 2011. 
Dr. Wyatt has been around for a long time, and he's been writing about polio, provocation polio, and different aspects of polio since the earlier days. I don't know exactly how long, but I think since the 1950s, maybe 1960s. Well, he proposed a theory that the epidemic could have been initiated by a unique neurotropic strain of polio virus that was being refined a few miles from the epicenter of the epidemic. At Rockefeller Lab, scientists were experimenting on a mutant polio virus called the MV strain that had high affinity for nerve cells. The documented intention of those scientists at those labs was to produce the most virulent strain they could. That was a very curious priority, don't you think? Well, the epidemic was no regular epidemic. The case fatality rate was 25%, which is the highest ever recorded in history. Also unique to this epidemic was that it began in early May. Polio epidemics don't, be, don't begin until the end of summer and early fall. So something else was going on. And like I said, this set the stage for fear. Now imagine what the country was like when this, when this epidemic happened. People were ready to do anything they could to get rid of polio, to stomp out that darn virus. Now let's go over to the second spike in this graph. And you'll see there's a lot going on right over here. And this is what I'm going to spend most of my discussion on. The second spike involves changes in the cause, the treatment, the susceptibility factors, and the definition of polio. During the 1950s, prior to the vaccine, there was a wide net cast in order to, to catch everything that was called polio, and everything that could be called polio was called polio. There are also changes in um, breastfeeding during this period of time. There were changes in DDT use and production. Arsenic was used. Tonsillectomies were done at breakneck speed right around here. The way uh, diseases were defined changed through here. And then there were changes in the, how we refined sugar and flour, which I'm going to get into in a moment. I'm just, this is just an overview, so just kind of set the stage for things. The 1930s and 1940s saw an abrupt rise in formula feeding after the AMA began to endorse infant formula feeding and doctors believed it was a safe equivalent to breast milk. At the same time that infants were deprived of breast milk, we saw a rise in polio cases. Now if we look at this graph, what we see is, I can't see it very well, but I think I, I remember it. So 1911, I think, is right around here in this curve. And what we see over here is this time is on the uh, y-axis. Uh, the, basically the years that things were started, and then over here on the x-axis, it's length of uh, persistence of breastfeeding. And what we see is that, you know, as time went on, well, the late 1800s is when, okay, let me start from the beginning. Prior to the late 1800s, all infants were breastfed. If you didn't want to breastfeed your own infant, you hired somebody to do it. And it was a profession. Wet nursing was a profession. But at the end of the late 1800s, uh, condensed milk was patented. And people started feeding their infants condensed milk and cow's milk and powdered milk towards the late 1800s. In the early 1900s, they started making primitive infant formulas. Well, they're all actually primitive, but these were super primitive. <laughs> and, um, and so when you see the lack of breastfeeding, what's taken its place is garbage, basically. Well, if we look down where the biggest polio epidemics were happening in the 1940, 1941, I think, to 1950, that is, there was a 25% uptake or uptake, a 25% uh, initiation rate of breastfeeding, and that the breastfeeding did, didn't continue for very long at all. Most people were finished around five, six months. Exclusively breastfed infants were exempt from polio, as noted in several epidemics. Those that had other sources of food, including cow's milk and fruit, were not exempted. And there's a reason for that. I think there's a fourfold reason. One was due to lack of maternal protection that's afforded by breast milk, which is irreplaceable. Second is due to the toxicity and inferiority of formula that can never ever under any circumstance mimic breast milk, which is literally a living organism. Breast milk changes with the age of the infant. It's basically tailored to, to, to feed whatever's going on with that baby, and it can't be replaced. The third thing is that DDT in cows was coming through the cow milk that all cows were basically treated with DDT, they were dipped in arsenic, there was all kinds of toxins going on, and this is not a secret that there was DDT in the, I mean, it may have been back then, but it isn't anymore. I can't read my own writing here. The other thing is that formula um, is basically an immunosuppressant. 
You know, when you think about how the bowel floor, how important that is, and that 70 to 80 percent of our immunity is there, well, when you look at an infant's uh, bowel flora who's been fed by formula, it's a completely different constitution than what it, what it is uh, from a breastfed infant. No talk about vaccines, in my opinion, is complete without talking about breastfeeding. So I'm going to go on for one more slide. If you'd like to read more on the biology of breastfeeding, I highly recommend this website, beyondconformity.org.newzealand. There's enormous amounts of fascinating information, not just about breast milk, but about vaccinations. Everything is backed up with medical literature. You can click right on the links right there. You don't even have to go find the articles for yourself. It's a great site. Oh, let's see, where am I? Breastfed infants whose mothers eat properly are endowed with everything they need to be healthy. God made everything perfect, but for some reason, humans and their science have done their best to interfere and assume that they can do better. The infant immune system is designed to be, be anti-inflammatory, as it's learning to be in a world full of new antigens. Imagine the antigenic stimulation coming into a newborn. You don't want it to be hyperreactive. While that immunity is developing, breast milk does the work of infection control and forms a safety net in that baby. Alterations in that system come as a result of nutritional deficiencies in pregnancy, of, from cesarean delivers, deliveries which suppress the immune system and fail to colonize babies with good gut flora. And vaccinations have the potential to shift the immune system towards an epigenetically altered pro-inflammatory phenotype. And that's not good. When the immune system gets stimulated too early, problems come, come on later. Well, breast, breast milk inactivates pathogens and it orchestrates the immune system. And I've got three references here. Breast milk, you put it in with pathogens, basically dissolves bacteria, dissolves viruses. Breast milk contains probiotics, and it also contains nutrients that make a perfect microbiome for those probiotics, not only to be dragged down through the mouth after they're swallowed at birth, but then to colonize properly the intestinal system. Breast milk also contains stem cells, and that's something that scientists found out in 2007. It's not the only place that stem cells come from. Stem cells are also found in the placenta. And there's another somewhat puzzling practice that's been going on since at least 1941, because there are papers written about it when doctors were upset watching what was happening, and that is early cord clamping. Humans are the only animals that clamp the cord be before it stops pulsating. And what they do in that pr process, besides offer the parents for $3,000 to bank those stem cells that belong in that baby for later when it gets cancer, for a rental fee of several, I don't know, $60 per month or something like that. But what else it does besides depriving that baby of stem cells is it, de it basically deprives that baby of a third of its blood volume that it needs that's set back in that placenta. When a baby's being born, it's supposed to be pliable while it's going down the birth canal. It's a great system. <laughs> you know, so, so some of its baggage gets left behind, it's born, and then it gets flushed through, the stem cells go through. Well, another puzzling thing to me is this vitamin K at birth, because if stem cells are going into an infant, you'd think you'd want this, the blood to be very thin so these stem cells could go where they need to go. 30% of infants are born with microhemorrhages, but the, the, the vitamin K is supposedly given to prevent hemorrhaging, but the stem cells are what's going to really go in and take care of the problem. So if you give vitamin K to a newborn infant, you're thickening their blood and those stems, first of all, if, if you were, were to give them the stem cells, they're not going to go where they, want, where they need to go. The other thing is that you can really have it all. You can still wait to clamp the cord and get stem cells out of the placenta, but that's not offered to parents. There's another protein in breast milk called Hamlet, and that stands for human lactalbumin made lethal to tumor cells. So we keep discovering new things about breast milk that scientists didn't know before. And I think we've only really hit the tip of the iceberg, but this is a fascinating protein for people who are interested in, in the cancer spectrum that this protein is another um, element of science that de defies how science was previously defined. It's a protein that can shape shift and it can do different, it become a food and it can become a cancer annihilator. And you can go read about it on that link right there. It's a Swedish scientist that discovered it and she's now been fully funded and she's working on finding out more about that. But the bottom line is that that really belongs in the infant. But no, nonetheless, that, that protein will probably be exploited by industry before too long. The other thing about breastfed infants is that they tend to have higher IQs and neuronal connections, and I have a reference for that there, and that they have 70% lower type 1 diabetes mellitus. My last comment on this slide is that 
uh, Bartik in 2011 published a paper and his conclusion about breastfeeding was that if 90% of infants were exclusively breastfed for six months, every year the USA would save $13 billion and avoid 911 preventable deaths. I mean, breast milk is really amazing and it's very protective.